So um, I read all of them, and I was totally addicted to research. And I also went and asked the Federation to find me all the old men they could find who had been on the wharf in 1928. And there were quite a lot of them around because when you were 16 in 1928, you were a man. You earned a man's wages, you worked a man's hours, 12 hour shifts, and you were expected to do what men did. So there, a lot of them were still alive. Two very remarkable ones were the best friends, Tom Hills, who was known as Red Tom, uh, and whose brother was a legislative assembly member in New South Wales Conservative, which I thought was very funny. He said, I haven't spoken to him for 35 years. I thought, understandably, really. <laughs> Red Tom was that they were wobblies, which is the industrial workers of the world. They're not, uh, they're communists, but they're not communists of a, a Trotskyite or Maoist or anything else. They're just wobblies. They just want to improve conditions for, for workers. And um, his best mate was Tipo Hayes, whose grandfather was tried and acquitted for treason at Eureka, he told me. And I looked it up, and he was. <laughs> Isaac Hayes, a Tipperary man. So Tipper was so small, he, he was only as big as me. He was um, started off life as a jockey. And Tom Hills was a big, strong work. And the, once I stopped getting out, I, I stopped trying to interview them and let them talk. Um, the tapes are full of me giggling and them telling these funny stories. Um, I found out an awful lot about what it was like to work on the wharf in 1928. So having put all that together, I did my thesis. I got a gold star and an elephant stamp, and I put it away. Because uh, I just couldn't bear to throw away all that research. I'd said, taken a whole year of my life, I was absolutely addicted. So I, um, I put it all away. And then I thought, right, fine, I've got to get through university and I've got to get a job. And by that stage, they'd invented legal aid. So I had to join legal aid. So after a lot of mucking around, I did. But I had been writing novels all along. I wrote my first novel when I was 16, sitting up in my mother's apricot tree, because I was supposed to be minding my siblings, and I could see them from the tree. They couldn't climb, and I could. And if I saw them doing anything wrong, I could throw old apricots at them. <laughs> and so it was a very good vantage point. And, and I just sat there and wrote this story, which of course, like all first novels, was an imitation of my favorite novel, which was The Lord of the Rings. It was called The Magic Stone, and it was terrible, but it was about 100,000 words, because it's that thick, handwritten, because I couldn't bear to stop writing, and I didn't actually know how to stop writing. Um, I always used to hate, hate it when my stories came to an end. So I realised at this point that short stories were not going to be my field. <laughs> and I was just writing novels for fun. I wrote the sort of novels that I wanted to write. Um, I wrote uh, a whole lot of novels about a highwayman in um, St Albans, England, in 1740. I wrote a, as a present, birthday present for my friend David, um, who has been a joy and a delight to me ever since I met him in second year university. Um, I wrote a John Buchan novel for him because, about the assassination of the royal, the royal family because he was so fond of John Buchan. And all that, I just did it for fun. I was writing in the way that other people read. I was writing the sort of books I like to read. And I never thought of it as being a particularly a profession. So finally I got into legal aid, and I finally got to do what I thought I'd be good at, and I was good at it, I am good at it, I'm still doing it. Every Friday I'm a fixture down at Sunshine Court, <laughs> explaining the inexplicable, <laughs> defending the indefensible, and rescuing the folded, stapled, and mutilated. But, and then I thought, oh, I'm getting old, I'm nearly 30. <gasps> so, I'll have to try and get published. So I wrote this huge book, um, historical novel, I never thought of myself as a crime writer. And I wrote this huge historical novel and I sent it round to all these different publishers. Do not do this at home, guys, boys and girls. If you want to get a novel published, the first thing you want to do is go to the writer's centre in, in, uh, in the city and buy their little yellow book that's got how to submit a manuscript in three easy lessons and with all the, all the different people and everything in it. So you don't want to do it the way I did it, which was to photocopy a page out of the, out of the phone book and just send the book round to different people. And every three, three to five months, I'd get it back, postman it, throw it over the stairs, they'd hit the front step and I'd think, oh, no. And I'd undo it and they'd say that there'd be, you know, <laughs> wine stains or coffee stains on the front page. And the piece of cat fur still on page 87, indicating that no one had read it. And uh, I would think, oh dear, and then I'd turn it around and send it off again, because the real difference between published and unpublished is that you don't give up. But I'm just very ambitious, but I'm also very bad-tempered. I thought, no, stuff it. <laughs> as it says, as I think it is, um, Cassius says in Julius Caesar, um, I am now steeped in blood so deep, returning is as tedious as going on. So, you know, might as well keep going. Excuse me. 
so I put a book into the Vogel Prize. Anybody under 35 should instantly do the same. I didn't win it, which is good, because it wasn't a very good book. I'd sort of be embarrassed if it had got published now. But at the time, I was sort of, you know, I wasn't expecting anything to happen. So I'm sitting in my office at Legal Aid, and I, um, Hilary McPhee, who at that stage ran up with um, Gribble, the Diane Gribble, ran a publishing house called McPhee Gribble in Fitzroy, rang me up and said, come and talk to us about a book. And my boss swears I went past him with a Doppler effect. I'm going to go and see a publisher. <laughs> Ooh, I don't remember how I got there. I really don't. I might have run or possibly flew. Or maybe I biolocated. But in any case, when I got there, they said, it's a big pink factory in, in Brunswick Street, um, just off Brunswick Street. They said, interesting book, Kerry. Don't want to publish. And I thought, oh, well, just, just leave me to die here. I don't open the door. I'll just slide out under it. They said, how about writing a detective story? I said, yes nanoseconds after she finished the question in case she had time to change her mind. And then I said, well, look, I have to write a historical one because I, at that stage, was very nervous about writing about the present. You know, thinking I'm going to include clients. So I, it just didn't seem to work, you know. I once revisited a story every year from my age 14 and I still couldn't do it. So, you know, I just didn't like it. So I said, oh, 28, I know everything about 1928. I didn't. But I thought I did. And I will come up with a detective story. She said, OK, here's a two-book contract. So I walked out in a haze of absolute delight with a two-book contract. Just about to get on the tram in Brunswick Street, and I had what is known as the oh shit moment, which is, <laughs> what have I done? I've never written a detective story in my life. I have no idea how to write a detective story. Eek. So I stuffed my contract into my bosom, close to my heart. And got on the tram, and I thought, all right, I'll do it the way I always used to start writing novels, because I've written about, you know, 12, 15 novels, you know, novel-length things. So I know how I start, which is to start off with a person. So I thought, I need to know what she looks like. And I was thinking of the perfect 1928 figure. She has to be small, because tall girls, if you please, Miss Fisher, and turn, uh, thank you. She has to be small. She has black hair, which curls at the corners. She's slim. She's beautiful. And she's got um, amazing style. And I thought, all right, so I knew what she looked like. Uh, she looks like that. That's what she looks like. Thank you, Miss Fisher. And I, um, I thought, all right, I, I need a name. So as the chain is clacking down Brunswick Street, click, 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 click. I thought, I'm, I'm going to get into trouble for this because nobody writes detective stories. It was, this is 1988. This is considered to be extremely, you know, decades, say. They like writing romances or westerns. Genre fiction, it's not, uh, it's not respectable. So I thought, I need a respectable name. What's more, I also need something for which I can, I can do what is known as that preemptive rave. Now, I smoke cigarettes, which is a terrible thing to do, but I do. And I object strongly when people rush up to me in the street when I don't, I don't even know and say, do you know what you're doing to your lungs? And I know, I know fat women, though it's never happened to me, possibly because they know I can spit. Um, they've said, you know, I could peel all that fat off you. You know, people make these kind of comments, how dare they? And so the thing to do is, when you're confronted with something like that, is to say, do you realise the genetic evils of chicken stock cubes? And it's astounding how their self reliance just disappears and they just crawl away quietly. That's all I want them to do, just go away. And indeed, stop using chicken stock cubes, probably. Anyway, so I wanted a preemptive raid for the subject of detective stories, so I knew my character's name was going to do it. So I thought, first of all, I was thinking of Greek names because 1900, which is when Franny was born, was a big, a big year for christening your children with what the English family thought were Greek names. Um, and they were Greek, but they were kind of bent. So there was one poor little thing who was christened Xerxes. It's no, there's no, it is a lot of raw work at the font, geez, you know. Um, and various other things, but all of the names I could think of and female names were just too nice. There was Iris, which is Iris, Nymph of the Rainbow. There's Irene, which is Irena, Goddess of Peace, although I've never met an Irene who wasn't dead stroppy. There's something about being called Irene that just does things to a girl. And there was um, Psyche, the Nymph of the Rainbow, who you know, um, had to chase uh, Eros over half the world before she got him back again. It's not the right thing. You know, I didn't want that. I wanted a really strong female name. I wanted to write a female hero. Something like Leslie Charteris' The Saint. Anyone remember The Saint? Yeah, it's slightly less prone to shoot people, but, you know, basically. Um, I wanted a, a, a hero. I wanted a female hero to find out what she'd do. She frequently shocks me. 